Take web application security to a whole new level with NetSparker, a complete vulnerability assessment and management solution that seamlessly integrates with your Agile software development pipeline and easily scales as you grow. Get a demo today. Andrew Clay Schaefer has a long history helping people deliver systems with better tools and processes, evangelizing DevSecOps before DevSecOps was a word, and helping to organize the DevOps community since the earliest days of the movement. Gravitating to agile methods as a competitive advantage for software development at startups in the early 2000s, Andrew pioneered new ways of working to automate systems that evolved into practices that are now mainstream. Interestingly, as part of OWASP's operating plan for 2021, the goal of the year is to help fund grants that let project leaders build DevSecOps into everything we do at OWASP. We really want developers to be central to our mission once more. Working to the side of development teams, telling them that their baby is very ugly, is basically the worst way imaginable to develop secure applications. Developers see you as the enemy, and things that would be simple fixes become onerous and adversarial for no reasons. We, as an industry, must move beyond pretending to be auditors, because with few exceptions, we are not auditors. I look forward to hearing from Andrew on how we can move the industry forward. Please welcome Andrew Schaefer. Welcome. Hello out there. I'd like to start by thanking the OWASP organizers for inviting me to give this presentation. And I'd like to thank you for choosing to spend the next hour with me. I'm Andrew Clay Schaefer, and I'm going to talk a little bit about embracing conflict, a DevOps story. Hopefully you're uh, somewhere safe with a time zone appropriate beverage of your choosing. An alternative title for this would be software is eating software or maybe software is eating software security, but it's also eating everything else as uh, some of you might know. So just a real quick introduction. I'm Andrew Clay Schaefer and essentially the last decade of my career has been spent focused on open source infrastructure and a bunch of tools for doing automation around you know, clouds and also bringing the, the practices to, to, to that. And you know, I've been part of DevOps days, which I'm going to explain a little bit about, and uh, participated in writing uh, some books. And there's a bunch of those I'll, I'll kind of mention in passing as well. And then the last year, I've been at Red Hat, focused on helping organizations really marry the, the, the best open source projects with the best practices to get the most out of their technology investments. So like I mentioned, I'm a Red Hat. Uh, that's my Twitter handle, so that's also very important. This is the uh, fastest way to get a hold of me. If you want to continue this conversation or talk about anything else, you can hit me there or, or LinkedIn. I'll re respond to Twitter probably faster, um, but what have you. Uh, this is my logo. And just to kind of keep you uh, full disclosure, I come in various configurations uh, of hair and beard. So if you run into me somewhere else, I might look slightly different. I'm, I'm not sure if this is my uh, COVID beard or my election beard, but right now we're, we're, we're avoiding the barber and the razor. So with that, let's move on. I, I, I don't really like the word DevSecOps. I also didn't particularly like the, the word DevOps. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And before that, I really didn't like the word cloud. And but here we are, right? So this is this is the the industry we're in, and and the buzzwords of the day, and the fashion tribalism. So get off my lawn. I'm a I'm a grumpy old man sometimes. So today I'm going to talk about me. In some ways, I'm going to talk about you, and us, and DevOps, and conflict, and confusion, and software, and security, and hopefully. Hope by the end of it. Sometimes people introduce me by saying silly things like this. So I invented DevOps. I, I think that's uh, actually absurd. And if not embarrassing, certainly a little embarrassing to me sometimes when people say that. Because the truth is, I didn't invent DevOps. I stole it. I had a very fortunate uh, 
perspective to to see a lot of things evolve in the industry and i was in a place where i could talk about them so there's not really root cause and this has been an ongoing discussion uh, on twitter the last few days actually is like where some of these ideas came from and i'm going to argue and and you know you'll see uh, in a few minutes that they they kind of they kind of came from everywhere there's there's no like one place but there was a particular point in time that that captured kind of the gestalt of, of some of these conversations and i'll i'll point to velocity conference as one of the kind of proto devops so so this is velocity 2009 this is before devops is is coined as a term and I'm in the audience watching my friends John Alspa and Paul Hammond give their presentation of 10 deploys per day, Dev and Ops cooperation at Flickr. And this is, there's, you know, you could go watch this talk. It's actually recorded. And, and they were making some really good points. And, and it, was a, it was a fun talk. And at the time, it was also kind of mind blowing for, for people to say that they were doing 10 deploys per day. Now that's actually. I'd say passe, and you have places on on record at deploying basically every second, you know, across the fairly fairly massive microservice architecture where everything's decoupled and you can deploy independently. That's that's passe now, and, and you know, continuous delivery, DevOps, whatever. There's like a bunch of buzzwords that led to this, but at the time, this was this was mind blowing. So I was in the audience, 2009, and I was I was tweeting. As as people did, as people did, and and this is uh, basically me quoting um, John Alsbaugh. Don't just say no. You aren't respecting other people's problems. And I, I happen to tag it DevOps. And here's a bunch more. And I don't necessarily need to read them all for you, but you can you can see that it's basically operations and development talking back and forth about how they they need everyone to kind of have a trust and, and collaborate and respect to get the most out of, of the work they do together. And I'd already been conspiring with Patrick DeBlock, who I'd met in 2008. And we were planning to do, uh, so I met, I met Patrick at the Agile conference in 2008 in Toronto. And, and we were planning to do some, um, conference that was focused on agile infrastructure or trying to bring kind of agile software development practices to infrastructure and he was he was watching this uh, tweet stream from velocity and and he said we're going to call it devops days and that's kind of the the first use of that term and and the kind of like the gestalt that was created from DevOps days and, and that community of practice that grew out of that is, is where we get the, the buzzword du jour. But that was 2009, and this is 2006. So this is a, a interview with Werner Vogels, who's the CTO of Amazon. He was the CTO of Amazon at the time. He's still the CTO of Amazon. And in this interview, he says, and I'll, I'll read it, the traditional model is that you take your software to the wall that separates development operations and throw it over and then forget about it. Not Amazon. You build it, you run it. This brings developers into contact with the day-to-day -day operation of their software. It also brings them into day-to-day -day contact with the customer. This customer feedback loop is essential for improving the quality of service. This is 2006. That sounds suspiciously like a lot of the conversations people have in the DevOps community. I'm going to I'm going to argue this is something that all the kind of cloud natives, which is another term we'll, we'll kind of use a bit in this talk, they, they kind of go through this phase where the developers have some ownership for the operational burden of the services they build. I personally feel like the SRE model kind of takes that a step farther, and we'll talk a bit about what that, what that means as we get through this, and I'm going to hopefully tie that back to some notions of security as well. So this is 2006. So this, you know, we're, we're taking snapshots in time, and I think it's important to, to mark the year. So 2009 is when DevOps the term, 2006, Werner Vogel's talking like this. This is 2007, and this is from a blog post, which you can, which you can go read on um, O'Reilly Radar, which is the framing from Jesse Robbins, who at the time was working at Amazon, and 
specifically in operations, and, and he is making this argument that the operations is the secret sauce of startups. And in this graph, which I've dissected um, over and over, and I actually wrote a 2010 update to this blog post, which you can also find on Radar, is, is essentially uh, the, the graph represents, or the, the, the colored parts of the graph represent human, human toil. Uh, and, and you know some people like that word or don't like that word, but but the idea here is that in in traditional approaches to operations, there's much more hours of human work involved to get to the same kind of scale and reliability. Where in this sort of new way, so this is sort of the golden age, you know, a, a puppet and some of these tools that that we can invest more in some of the kind of thoughtful automation around configuration, and that will give us a very different curve. Um, in, in, at least in terms of the, the human hours spent to scale relative to the, the traditional method. And this is uh, another interesting point in time, so 2007. So this is 2008. This is, these are slides I used to give when I was talking to people about Puppet and, and you know, the dev and ops, although we didn't call it DevOps yet. I, I had dev and ops in my slides, but we didn't call it that yet. So it's like we have walls of confusion between developers and operators. And, and, you know, some people will argue Sarbanes-Oxley says this, that, and the other. And uh, I've read every, every word of a Sarbanes-Oxley. If you'd like to uh, have that discussion, that's not what it says. The lore is not the law. Uh, what it actually says is that you're going to have controls and you're going to keep certain promises. It doesn't say that developers and operations can't work together, or talk together, or do certain things. It's uh, very interesting how that got interpreted. So this wall of confusion that, that, we, we don't even see each other as human sometimes in these organizations. We, we only pass these, these tickets and these emails back. So we're kind of dehumanized, makes people unhappy or, or even worse. Right? And I gave, I gave these exact sort of slides in 2008 with the fire and everything. And, and I'll argue, and I'm going to come back to this, that there's, there's kind of these two forces uh, of dev and ops. And, and it's kind of two different games, which is a, hopefully a, a point we'll make really strong um, in the middle, but th this is something that I think is, is like forever. This is like this timeless conflict, this core conflict between developers who kind of incentivize to create and, 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 and innovate, and that's destabilizing for us. And then operations is is sort of incentivized to stabilize and keep everything, you know, standardized. Efficiency versus innovation. So this is this is a book I, I helped um, write a chapter for Agile Infrastructure in Web Operations 2009. Um, and so just for the sake of kind of having the conversation and, and having interesting, I'm going to call everything, uh, 2006 and, and, and before is before cloud. And then there's a space in the middle and then 2009 and afterwards, we're going to call that after DevOps. And so there's this, there's this point in time that everything's sort of becoming more software driven, more API driven on the infrastructure and allows us to do. What, what kind of becomes the, the, the DevOps conversation. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through some of that. But first, I want to kind of point out that everyone wants the DevOps, but they actually don't. Here's, here's what they really want. What they really, really want. They want scalability, availability, reliability, operability, usability, observability, all for free, probably some other illities. Throw them in there. Why not? We'll, we'll add security later, and and without changing anything, right? So that that's what most organizations actually want. And just to make that point really clear, I'll just make the text really big. So a lot of organizations, and there's a couple forces we'll talk about through the through the end of this that they they want these these benefits, but they don't necessarily want to change. And there's there's reasons why that happens. And then just to kind of make the same point, I think everyone would love to have great security, you know, software enabled and enforced security, um, but they don't necessarily want to change anything either. And that that's on both the organizational aspect and, and in some sense the the security practitioner side, which was this, we had the same kind of resistance in system administration in the earliest days of a puppet or what have you. And then there's this little problem. So there's, I, I think this is a little bit of a miscategorization and it's sort of funny because 
I get in conversations with my my colleague um, John Willis, who now works with me at Red Hat, about how security wasn't invited to like DevOps, and I don't think that's necessarily true. And and particularly my my lens and glimpse into that is, you know, even even from early days inside of Puppet, there's a lot of conversation with um, security minded folks and in you know highly secure environments. And then furthermore, I think that it's um, when you when you think about the automation and some of the things that were brought to bear on these problems, being able to kind of put configurations into known desired states is pretty powerful from a security perspective. Um, and and then also, I, I, would, I would say this is borne out by the data. If you look at the you know state of DevOps report and Accelerate or whatever, that that the 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 speed and the cycle time uh, speeding up actually makes it both faster and safer. But but I think the thing you want to recognize and, and be clear about when we're talking, you know, the, the original kind of dev and ops tag came from this conversation about Flickr. And so to, to kind of frame it, what, what I would argue is, is not necessarily that the DevOps was ever really bad for security. It's just that a lot of the conversation because of kind of the nature of um, a few factors in the industry w- was centered around kind of this far end of the spectrum where the the role that you're trying to or the problem you're trying to solve is literally putting pictures on the internet. Like that's what Flickr does. Um, and then as you move along the, the spectrum, I think that you know you get you get farther along and there's money, right? And there's transaction, there's a bunch of things and, and now you even get into more regulation and these other things you have to deal with. And then and then on this farthest end, there's kind of life and death, right? And there and there's everything in between. So what is the you know, r- responsible way to approach these problems and to solve these problems on one end of this spectrum is not appropriate on the other end, right? And, and there's kind of everything in between. So I think that when you have rational people thinking about the problem they're trying to solve and, and you know, bringing the tools and, and the practices to bear on the problem that you're going to get something that's relatively appropriate, but then people get kind of stuck on where they're at. And, and again, I, that's going to come back uh, more than once, but this is just to, to, to frame this, this thing. And, and for the center of gravity in, in, you know, especially the early conversations around DevOps was, was definitely on this, this side of the spectrum um, towards the, the, the cats. And, and that's, uh, that's okay. But, but there's also like lots of demonstrable results um, as you move along the spectrum and, and, and we should take advantage of that as well. So, just a quick, and, and I would say I'm not a security expert. I've worked a lot with security teams and, and kind of like security projects. But in, in a lot of cases, a lot of organizations, operations is underfunded and, and security is, is as bad or worse. And, and it's not that there's not like investment in it and tooling in it. It's just like this weird thing where, you know, it's hard to measure. We'll come back to that too. But but it's the, if it, if you don't have, something where it's generating the, the kind of revenue that, that seems to drive the conversation as much as anything. And then you, you, you set up incentives with, with regulation or whatever, and kind of like try to make people do the right thing. But just, just telling people that they shouldn't do this thing doesn't necessarily uh, make them do the thing. If you don't kind of help them make it easy. And, and that will be, that'll be kind of like the, the, the grand finale. So at least reliability when we talk about reliability, that kind of has a hope of being measurable. I think security is, it's it's not as quantifiable, right? So there, there's no such thing as like, you're secure or you're not secure as a binary. In fact, you know, most people listening to this probably realize that, you know, there's always like some, some level of F escalation, some level of adversary where it, it's, it's, it's harder and harder for you to, to secure things in that arms race. But there's, there's kind of like the, the level that is um, proportional to the risk that you're exposing and, and the adversaries that you're most likely to do. But reliability, you can at least measure, you can both measure the metric of the reliability and you can you can sort of connect it back to dollars, especially if you're doing these sort of you know web things where you can measure everything. It gets a little um, bit interesting when you're doing you know embedded or, or crazier device stuff. But we so we we know we could do better. 
you know, th this is the this is the lesson, the, you know, the state of DevOps report, the data is out there, we know we can do better. So what what are we gonna do? Like, what are we actually gonna do? Well, there's this word, buzzwordy thing, and you know, I, I've been part of this community and, and I'm gonna explain what it means to me and what I try to do to make it actionable with, with a bit of a story um, around it. So this is the, the, the calms kind of mantra. If you're in the sort of inner circle of DevOps -y people, you'll, you'll hear them say calms or cams, um, especially, the, it especially used to be prevalent. Now, now it seems like not, not as many people know this, or, or, but it's sort of like a test of like how, how up to date you are or how inside of the, of the circle you are. So DevOps in this context, this is from a blog post that Damon Edwards and John Willis wrote after the very first DevOps days in the US. So DevOps, they, 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 they categorize it as culture, automation, metrics, and sharing. And that was kind of reflecting on all these conversations, these, this like kind of emergent community of practice that we were building in, and that's in 2010. And then Jez Humble, um, who some of you might know, who kind of has been in the same um, circles and wrote the continuous delivery book, he, he added that lean is probably an interesting thing. And so I'm going to kind of walk through a little bit of this. But first, when you, when you say this uh, kind of stuff like culture, automation, metrics and sharing or lean, like what does that mean? I, I think that's that's sort of hard to, to digest. And then it's not necessarily actionable. So a little bit of of the rest of this. And I have other talks that you can kind of find on the internet if you're so inclined to kind of try to break this down maybe a little bit more, but but it's, this is like an attempt to kind of think about these things in terms of, of actionable spectrums of things that are better and worse. And also I think it's worth reflecting that these things are not independent and that they kind of reinforce each other. That that when you, you, know, you have certain culture, then it lead, leads to better metric sharing, what have you. So culture eats strategy for breakfast. Very famous saying, I still don't know what that means. But this is the Western topology of culture. You'll find this in, um, it's in the DevOps handbook. It's in Accelerate. It might, it's probably in like a bunch of those other books, the same thing. And, and I first saw this from John Alspa, but it's basically an interesting framing. It has nothing to do with technology. It has nothing to do with DevOps. It's, it's like you know sociology researcher kind of kind of categorizing the these different cultures. And and so the thing that I hope we can agree on here is that on the left side, the the pathological is not as good as generative. You, you can tell it's not as good because it's called pathological. And I hope we can also agree that. You know, if you look through this this list of things here, that you know, low cooperation probably not as good as high cooperation. Um, a culture where the messenger is shot is probably not as not as collaborative as one where people are sort of trained to share contextual information. Uh, who wants to work somewhere where no one takes responsibility? Who wants to work somewhere versus versus where the risks are shared, where we like understand and and and, and have risks that we all kind of agree are, are relevant and, and proportional. Uh, bridging is this notion of, of if you have kind of the, the, the communities of practice or roles inside of an organization or, or different business units, are, are, they, are they communicating with each other? Are they sharing information? Are they sharing context? Are they sharing resources? And, and hopefully, I, I personally would rather work somewhere where bridging is encouraged, not where it's discouraged. Um, who doesn't like to um, be the scapegoat for a failure? Versus a culture where you know th there's a failure, that's a chance to learn. There's you know, and that that's one of the kind of refrains in some of these some of these communities is that there's there's no such thing as failure as long as you're learning. That might not be totally true, but the, it's it's fun to say. And and I, I, I'd rather you know we, we won't go there for now. But if you if you have a culture where novelty is crushed, the chance you're going to get innovation is close to zero. And if you have uh, a culture where novelty is actually implemented, then then the chance that you're going to be innovative is like higher, right? That that's like this is all sort of tautological in a sense, but I think it's an interesting framing to kind of have the rest of the conversation. And I'm going to copy this sort of three-column 
spectrum for the other things as well. So I'm going to move on to this kind of notion of automation, and I'm also going to introduce architecture. But there's, uh, I, I just want to give a shout out to this sort of notion of control loops with respect to automation, because it's it's essentially the central, um, it's the, it's the central model for the tools like Puppet, but then also the tools like Kubernetes. So so kind of the main difference there is in the in the old model, the the control loop was was really checking the resources that were on a certain node on a single system. Whereas you get to the, the newer kind of generation of platforms, then the, the control loops are basically looking at uh, service. And, and in, in those systems, you know, a node is essentially a resource in, in those services. But you're, you're going through this loop where you have some declared desired state, you're comparing that desired state to the current state, and then you're doing some actions, you know, if, if it's programmed properly to, to handle the, the, the state that is fine, uh, that it finds the, the, the system, and then, then it will try to get it back to the desired state. So kind of going with that model that I told you I would, you have these three columns, you have automation, and then I also like to add architecture because one of the things I came to realize in, in my, you know, struggles with, with automation is that certain systems weren't designed to be automated. I think that's also probably as applicable to security because certain systems weren't necessarily designed to be secured, right? And 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 so that that will um, hopefully be something that kind of comes out more and more as we get to later in the talk. But I'm going to say that manual is not great as great as a platform. And and there's a couple of things to talk about. It's not as detailed as the culture one, but in in a manual. Um, approach. There's basically a lot of of human hours that are spent doing tasks. When when things are failing, they tend to be catastrophic. It's kind of like the the Jenga strategy, and, and everyone's sort of focused on incidents. As you get better, then then there's more automation, but it, there's still a lot of scripting, and and maybe people get focused on disaster recovery, and in that world, you know, people are are focused on the meantime to recover. Where in in the highest performing sort of cloud native version of this, you have the platforms that are directing the architecture, kind of enforcing and guiding the architecture. Um, there's there's this notion of self healing, so they're they're operating under continuous partial failure, and this this is also a function of, of statistics. At a certain scale, the chance that any one component, you know, even at the hardware level, is failing gets to be you know, pretty close to a certainty. So you have to be able to account for those those failures or, or the system will come down. So let's let's move on to metrics. And this is a, a quote from the Borg paper. And I, I think that there's, this is kind of, I, I believe a gold nugget hidden in this paper. And the Borg is something I'm gonna mention at least another time or two before the end of this, but it's the container scheduler that Google used to kind of build Google. And in this paper, which describes, you know, the algorithms and containers and all the scheduling stuff and kind of pays homage to Borg before it gets to this notion of, of what we see with Kubernetes, there's this little gold nugget. And it says, almost every task run under Borg contains a built-in HTTP server that publishes information about the health of the task and thousands of performance metrics. And I'm going to argue, and I, I, have, I have this wager uh, that... If you if you spend time instrumenting your your code, making it you know quote unquote like the new kind of term of art is observable observability, then you're going to get more of an operational benefit from that than you will from like the fanciest container scheduling algorithm. So, moving on to this 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 kind of spectrum again, we have on one side unmonitored. There's not really much info. If you want to get information about something in the system, you're SSHing. You know, everyone's kind of got the the, the story, or or the you know, there's all these these monitors with the tail minus f on a bunch of different terminals, and and monitoring kind of in these cultures or these sort of scenarios doesn't really get done. It's it's you know ad hoc, tactically at the point of an incident. As you get better, kind of like the 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 middle of the road, you basically have. Uh, data, there's some aggregation, and, and the metrics are secondary. So it's like someone writes the application, and then someone instruments it and, and adds the monitoring later. In the highest performing organizations, where, where observability and, and you know this kind of notion of metrics is, is a first class thing, then instrumentation is built in 
by the developers or, or really it's provided by the libraries that the developers use. So it's, it's actually quite easy for them. So in this, this world, you know, this is where you start to get SLIs and like some of this other language um, from SRE. If you go to any kind of like the high performing um, web operation shops, there's always some nice big visualizations of the systems and the state they're in. And it's just a first class thing that is not something added. It's, it's actually the, the developers ha have, you know, embraced observability in the way that they, they build their stuff. So moving on to sharing, I think there's there's kind of some interesting things here. And, and you know, like I said, I have longer form um, talks about some of this, but the way I think of this problem, and, and there's, there's more communities of practice, but you basically have um, communities of practice. And I think, you know, this is oversimplification too, because there's not one, you know, developers are, are not a monolith. Um, operations, there's kind of like different things, business the same, security the same, but but it's, this notion is like, there's some notion of a community of practice. Right now, people watching this and kind of participating in this conference, I would consider, you know, to some degree, this is a community of practice and you're trying to bring, you know, shared understanding and, and shared things to this practice of, of security. And then what you want to accomplish in organizations to, to you know, serve the mission is is building communities of interest that, that span across the communities of practice. And we're, we're going to get into this notion of, of conflicts between um, two particular communities of practice um, and, and then kind of come to the end of this. But this is kind of an interesting framing to talk about sharing. So sharing, going back to the, the three columns again, you have this notion of the, these cultures where everything's hidden, everything's super strong silos, no, no one shares anything. Um, in some ways that information is, is used against people. Then you move to what I'll call, you know, the, the, there's a wiki, there's, there's something where people are trying to kind of make things available, but not necessarily um, cultivated, right? So the highest performing organizations, they cultivate information for people to be able to make the relevant um, decision because if you just have all the information all the time about everything going on in an organization, it, it's actually very hard to make sense of. And so there, there has to be like some notion of what's relevant and, and what, what is meaningful. And then also, I think that there's, there's this notion, you know, when you look at DevOps and, and I would say DevSecOps and some of the stuff that's emerging as practice is that we are all uh, solving similar problems. And in the sense that some of those problems aren't necessarily, you know, differentiating us, then it's better for all of us to to share those solutions in these global communities. Um, obviously, when you get to some, some corner cases of security, there, there's probably some things you don't want to be totally sharing. Um, and, and I'm sure everyone watching this has you know familiarity with some of the CVEs and, and like the way that disclosure is done. Um, but but there is definitely this like. Even there, there's like these spider web um, global community that are, that are sharing and taking advantage of each other um, in the, in the good way, right? So I'm a pretty smart person, but I'd argue that you know my ability to solve problems and and add value for an organization is is multiplied and magnified by the fact that I've built all of these connections to all these other smart people who've solved a bunch of problems that that I don't have to solve from first principles every time. So then moving on, if you're familiar with lean and, and the lean literature, then you'd realize in some sense, lean actually kind of covered all these areas in, in a self-contained way anyway. Um, we'll just ignore for a minute what a terrible metaphor manufacturing is for software. But there's one idea from, from lean that I really love, which is this notion of continuously improving. And whatever was was good enough today might not be good enough tomorrow and that we should never stop learning and never stop changing. And, and that's also going to be a recurring theme a few times before we get. So just to kind of keep with the, the same notion of the three columns, I'm going to say complacent, motivated, inspired. And hopefully we can agree that complacent is not as good as inspired. Also, I like adding link because column sounds way better than cams. Shrug. And also, lol. So that's the kind of the, the five um, things that, that were sort of part of the original DevOps conversation. And then there's like security. So what, what does security look like in this? And, and I won't pretend, like I said before, to be a security expert, but th this is kind of me um, 
commenting on, on what I've seen as what I consider kind of like the best way um, to do this or think about this. So, um, and, and, and it's following along with the kind of the same uh, pattern. So in, in some organizations, I would say security is essentially uh, theatrical and and there's just a lot of like hidden information and 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 people are they, they they use security as a position maybe to try to control behavior but they're they're not facilitating actual security they're they're just sort of hiding the 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 reality of it right and and then as you get better you know maybe there's some security added after the fact like we look at this thing that's going through some pipeline and we try to make it more secure we try to harden it or whatever um but then in the highest performing organizations, and, and I think we can actually get better, and hopefully this community of practice um, sees this and, and is going to be the champions that, that make it better, that, that security is something that is done from first principles. It's actually built in and facilitated by, by the, you know, the libraries that are available to developer. And I'm going to come back to more specifics about what I think that means and that there's a culture of ownership. Right. So it's, we're not we're not trying to blame. It's like we, we're, we're trying to own security from the real sense of, at, at, at every layer of, of the organization. And I, I don't know what the right thing is to say for that, but um, whatever. So this is a core conflict. And in some ways. I've kind of retconned all of the history of DevOps through this lens that I'm going to share. Uh, and, and hopefully it will make sense because like the the wording and some of the word selection when i first when i first heard it, it took me a minute to digest it but i'm going to try to explain it um as best i can because it, it's it's not necessarily um all from my ideas so this is this notion i already shared about the developers and the operators kind of have this this opposing force and and what what i'm going to say now and kind of explain is that these are two different games so they're they're ba basically they don't understand each other because they're kind of trying to play totally different games and they're, they have a totally different worldview. So this is someone on my team um, who's working on a PhD at Carnegie Mellon specifically about how organizations change their behavior to accommodate uh, new technology. And, and so this is language that, that he used in, in his research. And I'm going to use it because I, I really like it. And I've retconned, like I said, all, all of DevOps basically through, through this language. So the core conflict that we set up, and, and I called it games, but the, the words he uses in his in his research and dissertation is economy. So the, there's this notion of three economies, and whenever I say that, I'll give uh, credit to Jay because those academics get a uh, little uppity if you don't if you don't attribute their work. Anyway, so there's there's three economies, but we're going to start with two. So you have differentiation and scale. That's the the word that that Jay chose. And they're kind of they're kind of disconnected from each other. They kind of live in totally different things. So one, you know, simple, simplified version is focus on creating more value, creating more novelty. The other one's trying to drive down costs. So then here's kind of like a bullet list of things that that like categorize the differentiation game, the differentiated economy. They're trying to go fast. They're trying to create new things. They're trying to get fast, continuous uh, feedback on experiments, and they're really trying to make new stuff. Like this is the differentiation game. And then the scale game is about you know controlling risk and capacity planning, reducing variability, building things that are more reliable and consolidating, trying to drive down the cost through through standards. So there's this wall or the, the separation, right? We've already kind of seen this. We 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 have this traditional way of doing this, and, and you know, there's a bunch of rules and lore that got set up um, that kind of forces the these two games to be against each other. And I, I'm gonna say that the wall of confusion is not understanding the game the other the other team is playing or the other side of the wall is playing and and not seeing that you're connected right to me like the the, the devops magic really happens when when those two sides organizations like see that they that they are playing the same game i also think just just a quick um i didn't i didn't have this explicitly in this conversation for this this talk but there's sort of this this change that happens when everything moves to as a service, right? So in, in the world before as a service, when software shipped on physical media, operations and keeping servers alive didn't, didn't really mean anything except for like people couldn't get their mail for the weekend or what have you. But as you move to this this world where reliability is, is, is critical and everyone kind of takes for 
for granted that there will be reliability, then then it elevates the role the operation has to play because if the servers aren't working, if the services aren't up, then the software literally doesn't exist. And so so then it becomes more critical that people see that they're connected to each other. So is there a way to win both of these games, both of the, the you know, connect the innovation and efficiency game together? And, and I'm going to argue that there is, and, and to do that, we kind of play a new game. And this is what Jabe calls the scope economy, uh, the, the scope game, right? And, and this is like to simplify it, it's about building these shared resources, these shared platforms that can connect the, the two other games together and keep promises to both sides. So it, it's the scope economy in, in Jabe's language is basically balancing the differentiation and the scale economy to kind of enable both efficiency and innovation. And that, that's this abstract kind of academic way to frame that. But I think that if you if you can realize this, and I'm gonna to try to give you some examples in a minute, that you you can you can win both games. And the winning happens, and I'll, I'll say, I, I will argue this is the, every, every DevOps kind of engagement that I've ever considered successful came from both sides going through this process of an ongoing negotiation between their their selfish interests in favor of the collective, like seeing this bigger bigger thing they're part of, and and I think that that also would apply to security and and, and you know some of these arguments that, that I'm going to make will connect to security in a minute. So there's this notion of rebalancing the economic logic and recognizing that some things that begin as innovations in the differentiation economy are actually more valuable if they become a shared resource as part of a platform. And then vice versa, that, that there's things that in some organizations are probably being overly constrained um, and, and that there's a way to kind of standardize the way that those are, are accessed and, and bring those into the, into the scope economy as well. So here's some examples, some concrete examples. So this is, I'll just read this. Uh, remove friction from product development, high trust, low process, no handoff between teams. Don't do your own undifferentiated heavy lifting. Use simple patterns automated by tooling. Self-service cloud makes impossible things instant. So this is a story that's not my words. This is, uh, I think this is around 2014, right after Adrian left um, Netflix to go work as a VC, that, that he started talking about some of these lessons learned. And there's some other uh, bullet points, but this, this to me, like the, these are the ones that kind of describe the way that they built this shared platform that enabled them to, to facilitate innovation, but also, you know, uh, they, there's, there's pretty good reliability from Netflix based on, you know, my, my sampling of, of watching Netflix. So they're, they're kind of keeping, keep, keeping both of those promises. And then I'm going to argue and, and I, I believe I had a fairly privileged perspective to kind of watch a lot of this evolve over the last 10 years, that all these quote unquote cloud native organizations built this, this kind of shared platform. There, there's some you know, API driven way for developers to provision the, these resources and, and configure these resources and interact with these resources through APIs to kind of keep these promises. And, and they really had to do that because you couldn't get to the scale that that these organizations got to with those those more traditional methods. This is straight from the SRE book. Uh, SRE builds framework modules to implement canonical solutions for the concern production area. As a result, development teams can focus on the business logic because the framework already takes care of correct infrastructure use. Uh, that's a great book, Site Reliability Engineering. Um, the Site Reliability um, or SRE workbook, that's the kind of follow-up to that. I wrote a forward for, also a great book. And, and to me, this, you know, there, there's other things in that book, but there's snippets that are basically Google describing how they built this shared platform. You know, and this is, this is the Borg story. So on that note, I'm going to give you homework, but you didn't know you're going to get homework from a conference keynote. But um, I recommend everyone in any role related to any of this stuff, whether you're talking about dev, op, security, whatever, read, read these um, chapters from the original SRE book. You can read it for free. I think these are gold nuggets. Um, embracing risk, service level objectives, eliminating toil. If you've not done reading, uh, the communication and collaboration is also good. But this is this is like a framing for setting up a bunch of this other stuff um, that the SRE is is set up to, and and these aren't bad for thinking about um, security either. So this is Google's DevOps implementation. 
basically they, they check all these boxes. If you go through that book, um, it, I, I would say explicitly, essentially talked about each of these things in the SRE book. And my recommendation to everyone, good DevOps coffee, great DevOps deal. So wherever you find good, in, good, good ideas, you should take them and use them. So I already mentioned Borg a minute ago when we were talking about the Borg paper and sort of this notion of metrics and, and the HTTP servers that give you the instrumentation. This is a scope economy construct that emerged at Google. And then Kubernetes is a scope economy construct that's sort of like, you know, the daughter of Borg in a sense. And, and this is, it's also kind of like mind blowing that it's like Kubernetes is a global open source commons to build the local platform commons, whatever. Anyway, moving on. Uh, SLOs, I, I didn't explain or I'm not going to explain now, but it, it's in the, the chapters I just assigned as homework. It's basically this negotiation between the SRE and the software engineers that are agreeing that there's an air budget. And, and it changes the dynamic of the thing. If you blow your air budget, if you blow your SLO, then all of the feature work that the software engineers were going to do, you know, at least by the book, um, is now going to be refocused on reliability because we, as an organization, agree that reliability is important. That we're not we're not getting value if we're not reliable. And so, the, if the software development process is create, creating problems with with reliability, when we blow that, we're going to refocus the, the 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 workflows onto reliability. And this is an ongoing negotiation of of you know, between the SRE, essentially the operations and the development functionality, the, the scope economy connecting the uh, differentiation and scale economy. So we have these three economies, differentiation, scope, and scale. And then there's sort of three logics that, that you win the games with. So, so differentiation wins by creating new things, by creating more novelty. The scope economy, you win the game by creating more reuse and sharing. And then the, the scale economy, you win by creating more efficiency. So then in the kind of like the highest performing, you know, whatever DevOps cloud native version of this, you basically have enabled value creation with these platforms that are giving self-service access with these enabling constraints to this kind of underlying fabric uh, of resources. And then this is another shout out to another Carnegie Mellon uh, PhD. So this is Demeji Onafuwa talking about platforms, but he's not talking about tech. He's actually talking about any commons or any kind of shared resource. But I really like this language of recommoning. So platforms may be understood more conceptually as guiding principles that redefine two sides of a binary relationship that reveal the mass middle as an opportunity for innovation. Platforms can help us recommon resources, resource management through new approaches and negotiation. So he's got this um, PhD work, research on this model, which I think is fascinating, but I didn't put a bunch of stuff here, that, that's sort of modeled on how a, a Nigerian village um, which would, would manage shared resources. So there's this kind of notion of the tragedy of the commons, very classic, model for, for how this goes wrong. And, and you know, people like Demeji is arguing, no, there's like these, these great models for managing shared resources where kind of everyone can win as long as, as, as there's some negotiation where we're willing to give up some of our more selfish interests in favor of the collective. So recommoning, you know, again, I said I retconned all of DevOps basically through this language now, um, and I really love it, is this notion of understanding the resources um, that you're managing and then kind of determining where they should go, how they should be managed, and then moving them into, into the appropriate game and, and helping, hopefully helping everyone win, win their game in the process. So what if there's more games, right? So we have, we, we, we made this divide of, of create more value, drive down costs, and then, you know, there, there's like safety, security. And I think this is what most organizations look like right now. So you have walls of confusion and, and you know maybe some bad behavior not that anyone in, involved in, in watching this would would be part of that but I, I feel like I've seen you know this movie and and so what I'm kind of suggesting or, or hoping people will will embrace is this notion that that this this kind of shared platform that's an enabling um, constraint is is a perfect place to provide, the, these resources that can keep promises about security. And, and you know, why, why isn't there like site security engineering? And, and 
what is security engineering? I think this is, I, I believe I'm seeing this emerge. I think, you know, looking at some of the abstracts from this conference, I think you are as well. I'm not sure that this is the perfect wording or language for it yet, but but I, I think that we can all recognize that there's there's securing software and then there's there's software being brought to, to, to like bear on security problems. And both of those things are happening in a very interesting way right now. So this is, I'm just reframing the quote from the SRE book. Hypothetically, security engineers build framework models to implement canonical solutions for the concerned production area. As a result, development teams can focus on the business logic because the framework already takes care of security considerations. That sounds like a good idea. Embracing risk, eliminating toil, those seem like great ideas for um, to, to approach security, to, to approach kind of the proportional um, investment in security relative to the value that's being created. And, and what would the what would the, like the, sec the security level objectives look like um, in an organization? So coming to the end of our time together. This is this is legacy me in 2010. So this is uh, a blog post that I wrote. There's a group of people that kind of wrote like what DevOps means to us in 2010. And these are these are the main three points that I made at the time. So DevOps legacy Andrew in 2010 is the developers and operations can and should work together. We already had the wall of confusion conversation and that kind of stuff, but like let's work together, common interests, community of practice, community of interest. Then the second main point was that system administration is evolving to look more like software development. And in 2010, you know, EC2 has been out since 2006. You have Puppet, you have a bunch of other kind of like emerging um, monitoring things. So you can basically provision, configure, monitor through APIs. And as soon as you're writing all that stuff to APIs and putting all that stuff in, in code and, and in Git, then that looks suspiciously like software development. And we can start to use software development principles, practices, tools to, to bring to bear on the system, admi system administration problem. And then last but not least, and I think this is in some ways the most important, at least to me, and also probably my favorite, is that this is all evolving together as a global community sharing solutions. And I already made this point a little bit earlier, but, but I feel like my ability to solve problems is, is multiplied because I have connected myself to this global community of practice, um, multiple different practices, and, and I can kind of find the right person or, or, or right group of people. Maybe I don't know the person, but they know the person, and I can, I can solve problems through that global community. So now, forward-looking 2020 me is going to argue that DevSecOps, um, developer and operations and security can and should work together. Uh, security is evolving. It, it, it's, it's involving more software development. So it's, I think security is getting more involved in, in the software development lifecycle, but you're also starting to get better tools to, 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 to do that, right? And, and there, there's a lot of work left to do and, and hopefully that, um, hopefully DevSecOps treats you as well as Dev, DevOps has treated me, but basically building these tools to help facilitate that, to, to keep stronger promises about the software, to become that kind of security engineering discipline is, is what we're talking about here. And then last but not least, and, and I think, you know, a, a conference like this is, is actually making this point, looking at the abstracts and the conversations I expect you're having together, is that this is evolving together as a global community, sharing these solutions, sharing these ideas. So we, we live in this time, this world, you know, and, I, and we all basically carry these computers in our pockets. So this computer that I carry with me pretty much everywhere is more powerful than all computers on the planet when I was born. And it's connected to networks that you know have this incredible speed. You're you're more than likely watching this video through through this high speed network that connects it all together, and it's created all these experiences we have, right? So we we can push buttons on these devices, and people will come and get us, drive us places. Uh, we can order food. We can do our finances. We can do like what, whatever you can think of. You can kind of create. The, this digital experience around it, but it, it's also connecting us to these adversaries, right? So in, in, in a way we created all these experiences, but it's also created a greater surface area and exposed um, a bunch of risk. 
And and this is what I believe. So when people say software is eating the world, I, I don't I don't think software all of a sudden got hungry. I think that it's it's that aspect of the hardware, the software, the networks, all creating these experiences. And so what I feel is happening, what I feel like we're watching is that and, and participating in building is that every aspect of human performance and experience that can be optimized will be. And 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 we're we're actually doing that. We're we're like making that happen. So this is also including owning you, right? So people, there, there's a bit of an arms race in, in this where uh, as much as people are advancing the state of the art in, in one area, they're advancing the state of art in, in the opposite of that. So this is, this, this is a slide I use in, in many talks. This is Andrew's definition of DevOps, trademarked. Um, optimizing human performance and experience operating software, dun, dun, dun with software dun, 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 and humans. So it's it's that human performance. To me, like the whole point of this is us humans, right? And being able to do software, bring software to it is great, but it's also really about the experience that we have. And, and, and you know, if we're having bad experience, then maybe we should rethink some of it. So I'm gonna say the essentially the same thing for my definition of DevSecOps. So, DevSecOps to Andrew is optimizing human performance and experience securing software with software and with humans. So this is this is like I, I heard this more than once. Especially it's especially funny when people are like, we tried DevOps and it didn't work. And and I just think that's hilarious. And and in so, in some ways it's hard to it's hard to have a conversation because to me that that's just a silly way to frame it. Like DevOps is not, it's not an actual thing, right? And, and like people get all hung up on definitions and it's like, oh, if we just have this right definition then all of a sudden people could do it, I don't, I don't think so. So I, I feel the same way when people say that they have, you know, DevSecOps, it's like, okay, good job. This is not a thing, right? Implementing DevOps is not a thing. Implementing DevSecOps is not a thing either. DevOps is never done. Security is never done either. Right. So there's like this ongoing thing that you got to constantly reevaluate and improve. I mean, if you're checking CVEs, like, you know what it's like, uh, there's also this resistance to change. So we, we don't want to forget how we do things here. And you see this in in lots of these practices because humans kind of attach their identity to their to their task. So there's this resistance to change. Um, and this resistance might be the only thing more inv inevitable than change. So in the Western cultures, our last names are, are, they tend to be the vocation of our ancestor, right? So people have this like cultural attachment to their task. And so when you change, you tell people we're gonna do something different, like certain certain uh, personalities will feel that you're erasing their identity. And, and so you gotta figure out a way to make them heroes in the new version of the story. And they need a new loop. So we have this like control loop thing about automation. I think there's sort of this, this mental loop that we all sort of do, this is a way to give us OKRs, like some, some organizations have these sort of things. But what we really need is double loops to rethink the model, to make a plan. And this lets us change our OKRs, but actually, should we have OKRs? And and I, I don't think any talk I give is complete without at least one Deming quote. So people with targets and jobs dependent upon meeting them will probably meet the targets, even if they have to destroy the enterprise to do it. Edward Deming. So developers are under a lot of pressure to do things and they're under pressure to do things right now. So we have to make doing the right thing the easy thing because if it's not the right now thing, they won't do it. So this is me on Twitter, ad hoc automation is a problem, masquerading is a solution. Your platform has to audit and enforce your policy and at and, and the appropriate risk profile, right? So this is where we get into this notion of continuous compliance, continuous audit, continuous enforcement. Um, also, I'll, I'll comment that when DevSecOps is successful, which I think we've already seen with, with DevOps to some degree, uh, people will abuse the term, marketing ruins everything, and it will splinter into sub-communities because InfoSec is not one thing either. What are the InfoSec analogs for observability, reliability, resilience, and chaos. I'm not sure either, but that should keep us all busy for at least another 10 years.
Good luck and have fun. Thank you. I'm not here to answer questions. I'm here to have conversations. Thanks for joining me and have a great conference. Thank you so much, Andrew. If you're interested in hearing a little more from Andrew, he'll be holding a Q&A session right after this session. Before I tell you how to join, I have a few housekeeping notes for you. Our virtual expo hall is open now until noon and again from two to five this afternoon. Stop by to chat live with our sponsors and complete your scavenger hunt form. The virtual career fair will also be taking place this Friday. You can browse jobs now under the career fair tab. We also have live networking sessions happening this afternoon. You can find the different topics in the sessions tab, just filter by live events. And of course, be sure to tune back in for our live keynote speaker, Masha Sadova at noon today. Now for those of you interested in joining the Q&A, click the link that is below in the description. Once you're in, you will be muted. If you'd like to ask a question, you can put it in the chat. And if we need, to, need more information from you, we'll unmute you. Unfortunately, we do only have room for the first 500 people. Thank you so much for attending and have a great day.